Hey guys, this is Paul from Smart Easy DIY. Today I wanted to talk to you about this shed that I made. It is 10 by 16, a very nice size shed to have. A lot of these same ideas in this video will work for a tiny house or a small cabin as well. Now I realize this is a very long video to watch, so I included timestamps down in the video description below the video so you can go check out what you can find out where I did different parts of the video. So you can skip ahead if you need to, that way you have an idea what you're in for. The reason that I made this video so long is because there's so many questions that you guys had on the last shed video that I did that you wanted answers to, so I'm including all the details. You can find out all the things you need to to build this from start to finish. So if you're wondering how I got the rustic look on the siding, wait until I get to the part where I start staining the siding before I install it, and that will answer all the questions that you have on that part. I will also include a lumber list for you guys down in the video description. That way you can reference off of that if you wanted to see what you're in for as far as material list. All right, let's get started. All right, so the first thing I did to get my spot nice and level where the shed is going to be sitting is I brought in some three-quarter crush gravel that I had. Now, I'm not going to figure this into the expenses. I ended up having some leftover from doing my driveway, so I'm not really sure how much this ended up being. Just wanted to let you know that's what I did, and I'm going to pack it down. Then I'm also going to put these concrete blocks. They are four inches thick, eight inches wide, and 16 inches long. I've been working along here trying to get all my blocks put in. I'm putting four along here. So in a 16 foot section, they're about four feet on center. So what I'm doing here to figure out where level is exactly is uh, using one of the four by sixes that's gonna be for the bottom beams and using that to get it nice and level. So you can see here, I've been putting these blocks in. I put three quarter crushed gravel in here like I had mentioned earlier and I packed it down really good. I've been using this tamper right here that packs it down really good. If you have a plate tamper, you can rent that and pack the whole pad down but I had one of these, so this works pretty good. So yeah, I've just been packing those down. Just got this row in here. So you can see here, nice and level. When you're building your shed or tiny house, there's some things you need to think about with foundation. Now, if you're building something permanently, I would recommend doing concrete piers. Depending on if you have frost in your area or not, in the winter time, you need to dig down at least three feet, maybe four feet and pour it full of solid concrete, I would recommend. For this type of situation though, if you're gonna be moving your shed in the future, potentially, if you build a pad, you can just do something like this. You could actually set it right on the gravel if you wanted, just crush gravel and set it right on there. I decided to put it up on concrete blocks like this just to give me a little more height than my situation. So, but there's things like that that you need to consider. Now, if you're doing a tiny house, of course, you would probably put it on a trailer or whatever. So that's just something to think about. Did on the ends of the beams since they're going to be skids potentially. You don't want to leave the corners square because they could dig in if you ever have to drag or move your shed around like load on a trailer. So I ended up 45ing the corners. I went halfway down and 45 them in like that. That's what I did on all the corners. So once I got those cut, the next thing you have to think about is layout, how far apart you want your floor joists to be. I chose to go 16 inches apart in this case. So your layout, if you've never laid out floor joists before, what you want to do is go 16 inches on center or two foot, whatever you choose to do. Like say if you're going two foot, I chose to go 16 in this example. So you want to measure back three quarter inch and make a mark for your edge mark and then put your X in the center. That shows where center is going to be because for layout on plywood, whatever you're going to use, you want everything to work out that way. So you can see when I get over here to the last one, it's that way as well. And then I went a full 16 feet for my beams in this case. So the next thing I did is I set my beams up pretty much exactly where they need to go. And then to get them pretty much square, you don't need to get them exact yet, but you wanna get them close. You measure cross corner from the outside corner to this outside corner. And there are squaring calculators. If you look online, just do a search for foundation squaring calculators and you can put in your feet and inches either way and it tells you approximately what it should be. So you measure across that corner and then you would do the same from that corner over to that corner and just get it approximate. All right, the next step I wanted to show you is floor joists. So in this case, I'm gonna do 10 by 16 and I want my finished width to be 10 when I'm done. And since I'm gonna be putting two by on the outside going down through here, I need to cut these three inches shorter than 10 foot to compensate for these things being inch and a half on the outside, on either side. So since 10 foot is 120 inches, I cut them at 117 to compensate for that. So then what I did, I decided to have my beams in 16 inches from the outside. So since I don't have the outside one on there yet, I had to go 14 and a half to figure in that inch and a half there. Try not to confuse you, but I made a little mark down there. I'm just setting it up for now. And I did the same on this side. 
put my 14 and a half inch mark there. So then what I'm gonna do is tack these end ones on just with a couple nails, because I'm gonna be lagging these as well. And then that's when you measure cross corner and make sure everything is square then perfectly once you get these ones on. And I would recommend sorting and getting the straightest ones for the end ones that you can find. The other thing that I wanted to show you is when you're doing something like that, you always wanna turn the crown up on the board. See, like this, this one is an extreme case, but you can see which way the crown is. It's crowning to the right there pretty bad. So you wanna make sure on your floor joist that you turn that up because any weight that goes on there, that way the weight will just push it down straight if anything. If you start it with it bowed down already, then your floor is gonna get a pretty good sag in it already. So just wanted to show you that. That's a little trick that you do on floor joists. Another thing, if you're operating noisy tools, it's good to wear eye protection and ear protection. Now you can just hand nail stuff if you want. I happen to have some air nailers, so I'm gonna be using them. And be sure when you're nailing treated to use galvanized nails, whether you're hand nailing or air nailing. So now what I did is I nailed the end ones on as you saw in the time lapse, and then made sure I measured cross corner, make sure that it was square. And then to make sure that I get a nice straight line, I put a screw in each end and put a string up like that. And that way I can bring it right to that string and nail one end and then go over and nail the other end. All right, so another little trick that I like to do for hanging this edge board, I put a screw in on the far end, just up a little bit so it can grab. And then in that long of a span, it's good enough to set one end up and then I can nail that end over there and then come back and take the screw out and nail this end. So when I was nailing this outer board, I didn't have quite enough nails to put three in each one. So I ended up adding some exterior rated decking screws, some three inch, and that worked out good. All right, so then I was thinking about how to fasten these a little better into this beam to make sure they don't move. So I used these GRK, they're 5 16th by four inch. They're treated lumber approved and uh, they're really heavy duty lag screw, whatever you want to call them. I put them in with my impact. I did pre-drill this front one right here. The siding's going to cover it. You can see it's nice and flush. So the siding's gonna cover that. I used a drill just to make sure that it started correctly. I didn't use a drill on the others, they worked fine. For instance, what I did is I put one on one side of the joist, one on the other side of the joist. I just kind of alternated them down through there. If you want, you could add one on either side, but I think they bite well enough that I wouldn't worry about that part. Now here's a good thing for you to do. Try walking across all the joists and see if you can walk across without falling. All right, maybe you shouldn't do it, but if you're comfortable on floor joists, it's a fun thing to try. So I wanted to mention something really quick before I start floor sheeting. If some of you are watching this to make a shed for something to live in or a tiny house that you wanna live in and you wanna insulate your floors, I wanted to mention something really quick. You're probably gonna to wanna to sheet this somehow. That way you can insulate your floor and you won't have critters in there like mice and stuff. So what I was thinking about is you could use some two by fours. This is just a little chunk to demonstrate and I'm not gonna do it because I'm not gonna live in this, but now would be the time to do this before the flooring goes on but you would want to use something and you probably want to use treated because it's going to be underneath. This is just a thought I had, something for you guys to think about. You could run this underneath like this, so it catches like this. And then you could toe screw it on each side like this, on each end over there. And then in order to do this from the top, you could also put a screw in like this from the top, like toe screw it, like down through the middle like that. And then that would hold this up. And then you could sheet plywood in between each bay from the top down. Then you don't have to worry about getting underneath. So this is just another demonstration. So you could do this, and then your plywood would sit right against that if you wanted to sheet that. So that's just a thought. I'm not sure how it would come out over here on the end because you would see your 2 by But you could keep your 2 by back, you know, 4 inches or so so you don't see it from the outside. Or if you are gonna do that, you could use it like a two by eight out here instead of a two by six, make so it drops down more, so that way your thing would butt right into it. So just some options to consider if you are gonna insulate your floor. So yeah, I don't wanna spend too much time on this insulating the floor thing, but I can't stress enough that now is the time to do that. So I don't know if you guys quite followed along, but yeah, you could sheet with plywood then, you rip them long ways and you could sheet with plywood in there. I would recommend doing like half inch treated plywood or something 
That way everything on the bottom is treated. And then, so if you did a two by four underneath and split the difference from side to side like that, then that would catch your plywood. So you could do everything from the top. That would be awesome. If you did that, then you'd want to insulate with R21 or R19 right now, since it's a six inch floor joist right there and put that in the cavity too. You may even want to plastic it from the, on the top and then put your flooring on. Now, after you're all done, I would double check to make sure everything is square measuring across corner before you start putting your plywood down. So the treated plywood for the floor, I got at Home Depot. Lowe's did not carry them in my location. Home Depot was the best price that I could find. It was like $36 a sheet for the three quarter inch treated plywood. And every place else was like 50. So that saved me quite a bit by getting it that way. Now, if you don't have a Home Depot around, you may want to check elsewhere. I've heard that Menards is really good, but unfortunately I'm not in the Midwest as far as that goes. So there's no Menards option in my area. So Lowe's and Home Depot it is and or local lumber yards. Sometimes they have the best price. I got the floor down. I wanted to mention something. Normally I don't just like to run the joints all the same like this. On a shed I didn't figure it really mattered. And also I wanted to make less joints in the floor here. Because if I wanted to split this next one halfway... I could have put a sheet there, but I would have had to cut one in half and start with a four there, start with a four over there, and it would have made two joints instead of one. So normally you don't do this, but on a shed, I think it's just fine. Also the same for here, because otherwise I would have had to do some joints as well. So you want to check your sheets and make sure they're the right length. These ones ended up being a little bit longer than eight feet, so I just ran them long all the way and then cut them off later. So that's something you can do. Just snap a chalk line and just cut them off when you're done okay now it's time for trusses what I like to do is use this nice flat deck since you have a nice flat deck to work off of and use this for laying out the trusses so the first thing that I like to do I know that this is exactly 10 by 16 this shed is it's 10 feet wide so I know that the bottom of cord of my truss here I'm gonna want exactly 10 so what I do is cut it exactly 10 and line it up with the outside edge never mind the plywood you want to go with the actual framing in case your plywood is a little bit narrow and then so I do that on both sides and then I just stick a screw in it on each end also for your pattern that you're making your first truss with because you're gonna be cutting all the others according it's good to pick out nice and straight two bys that way you at least have straight ones to make your pattern with so then what I do is I go on the halfway point which in this case is five feet and I measure and make a line a little ways on your floor here don't worry it'll erase over time so then what I do, I decided that I want an 812 pitch. And if you don't know how to do an 812 pitch, you just put your square on here. You need a little speed square for this. And then you want to go where it says common here. You want to go with the 8, which it ends up being about 34 degrees as well. Since I'm cutting this on a miter saw, it's almost easier to go degrees. So you want to go 34 degrees. So that's how you get your peak. You want to do that on both sides of the peak. And then what I like to do is put a screw in each side to hold them together nice and tight. And then you gotta make sure to line the peak up right on that mark there, that center line. And then you wanna line it up, up and down until you hit right on the point right there. See how that comes together? And then what I did is make a mark on there now. So now that I got it all in place, I know where I gotta cut this. So that's the first step is to get that mark. And you have to make sure the peak is lined up at the same time that these are lined up on the outsides there. Once you make your mark and you cut these off, I think mine ended up being 55 and a half degrees on that part, but you want to double check, make sure yours is the same. And then once you get it all together, then you can screw the peak down so it stays. At least that's what I do. And I put it down here and then I measure off of the building here, the framing, and I wanted it to do seven inches. I'm going to do an eight inch overhang and I'm going to do a one inch rough cut fascia board. So I want eight inches when I'm done. So I want to make this seven because I want it to be eight all done with the one inch board on the outside, if that makes sense. So then you just make another mark here at an 812. And then that's how you get that one. So then you would do the same on this end. Get your overhang that way. And then you can measure from the peak and just make sure that they're both the same when you go to cut all your rest of your pieces. A couple things I wanted to mention about the trusses here. This is a critical part getting these trusses done right so once you got these all ready to go you got them all cut basically I'm gonna put these on two foot center 
you can put them closer together if you want. I think two foot is plenty. So that means that there is going to be nine trusses total. There's going to be seven in the middle and there's going to be two end trusses. They only get patches on one side on the inside. So you have to cut enough patches for eight total because you're doing, like I said, seven complete ones and two end ones. So you can figure that as one when you're figuring up patches and stuff. But when you're figuring up cutting this stuff, what I do is just lay, once you get your pattern here, you get it nice and straight ones and everything, like I said, then you can lay them on top of your lumber pile. And you want to make sure when you're building trusses to turn the crown up. Remember I talked about the crown earlier on the floor joists. You want to make sure to turn the crown up on the trusses and on the bottom cord and on the top ones. So always crown up. And then this is my stack here. I got them all cut. There's going to be 18 total of the top ones since it takes two per truss. And there's only going to be nine of the bottom ones since it only takes one per truss. So that's the count, 18 top and nine bottoms. The thing I wanted to talk about is I'm going to be making these out of one full sheet of 5 8 plywood. So I wanted to do an experiment here. I just used some Luan I had laying around and I wanted to see kind of what looks good measurement wise. What I came up with is three inches here, 10 inches here and 10 and a half wide. All right, so here's my full four by eight sheet of five eighth plywood that I laid all the truss patches on. What I wanted to show you here, the reason I went 10 and a half for the width there on these heel patches is because I was able to get it to come out really good over here with just a little bit of waste on the end. So what I did here, not to confuse you, but yeah, I just went 10 and a half, 21, 31 and a half, 42. So you, you get the idea there as far as that. And then I went 10 inches on this part, three inches on this part. And then I flipped it upside down and did that. The reason that I did that is because it came up to, from the bottom. If I laid it out that way, it came up to 26, just over half. And then I was able to lay out a whole bunch that way. And originally the peak patches here, I had laid out 16 by eight, but I had to scrunch that down a little bit to seven and three eighths, 14 and three quarter. And then because of, it was 22, I believe, since I had 26 on that one. So I had to scrunch them down a little bit, but no big deal. Doing it this way, with the four by eight sheet, I had enough to get 18 patches. I only need 16, so that'll be plenty. I'm gonna cut the corners off later on the miter saw for these ones, but I can cut them out square. It'll be easier on the full sheet. And then on this part, yeah, I got 36 this way and I only need 32. So I was able to make it work with one full sheet. All right, you guys, I'm ready to build trusses. So what I did, I put a block down there. I put a block on either side of the peak there, so it should just fit right in there. Nice jig and one down here. And then when I put the truss together, again, like I said, I like to put one screw in down there. You don't have to, but I just like that it holds it together. I like putting a couple in in the peak up there and uh, one down there. I wanted to show you here what I'm gonna be using in my coil nailer. I have two inch nails. They're a six penny nail, 6D. And the reason I like two inch is because that way I can nail straight on and I won't poke through because I have five eighth inch plywood and inch and a half material. So two inch should be perfect. Trusses are built. I set the end trusses off by themselves. They only have patches on one side. The rest have double patches. And my deck is clear again to build walls. So for laying out walls, I cut the top and bottom plate, both of them at 16 feet exactly to go on the end over there. And then to lay it out, you just do the same as you did for the floor joists. Except I'm going two foot on center. So this time you go 23 and a quarter and the X right on the two foot. Basically you stay a three quarter back from two foot on center. Then 47 and a quarter, just keep going on down the line. Then when you get to the end, of course, you just put an X there, but you can see there, 16 it is. So I got one wall built last night yet when I was working. It was kind of dark, so I didn't record it. I'm gonna record building the rest of the walls so on my last shed video, I did one that has steel siding and steel roofing. If you're interested, you could check that one out too. 
That is an eight by 12 building. And I built all the walls and put them off to the side and then set them later. I think this platform is big enough that I can build the walls, set them in place and brace them and then keep building them right in place here. So I think that'll work out good. So you saw the time lapse of me standing up the wall there. So yeah, what I did is it's not windy at all and this thing is pretty stable. So I just stood it up and I was able to put some screws in the bottom. I could have nailed it, but I don't have any more galvanized nails. So I'm just using the deck screws, the three inches, putting them down into the plate there. And then I put one brace in the back for now, put it level. And then I'm gonna do this wall over here, build that and do the same thing. And then I should be able to tip the other walls the end walls into place. So that brace back there will be sufficient for now until I get all the walls built in together and then I'll final brace all of them. Another thing I wanted to mention when you're building a wall, I always sight them and pick out the two straightest studs for the end because it just makes it easier to make the walls come together nice and level and straight if you pick out the straightest ones. Also, just like the floor joists, make sure to always turn the crown up when you're building a wall, that way you turn it out. It's just common practice and it's a good thing to do, that way the studs are all uniform. You wanna practice on a shed project, that way you get it right when you're building the bigger project too. Okay, now that I got those two walls set, I know my braces back there are off center a little, but they're doing the job. So next, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build a window in the back there, a little two foot by two foot, and I'm gonna do a five foot door on the front. So I gotta figure out what I want for measurements and get them started. So as I'm laying out this back wall here where the window's gonna go in, I wanted to cover this in case you don't have any experience with this. If I don't cover it, I'll probably get comments wondering why I didn't cover it. So if you are experienced in wall building, you can skip this part. But if not, this might be of interest to some people. So what I wanted to share here is I want the window centered. I measured what the length of my wall is going to be. It was 113. I cut it just a little bit loose so it'll fit in there, stand up okay. So the first thing you want to do for your window is you want to find center, if you do indeed want to center it. So I'm at five foot there. You can see where my center mark is right there. And then what I did is from there, so my window is 24 by 24 rough opening, so I have to have 24 in between, so it's gonna mess up my layout a little bit. So what you wanna do from your center line is you wanna go one foot and put the X on the other side of it because the stud needs to go over to have room for the window. So you wanna do that on both sides, and the rest of it you can do on normal layout. Now for this, you wanna hook on the outside of the outside wall, or if you're doing this not hooked onto the wall in place when you're laying it out, you have to put your tape on three and a half to account for that wall. And then you wanna just do this on normal layout, just like that. So two foot would be the center. So you wanna mark a three quarter inch back and make your mark. And if you do want this to be on layout, see this is gonna mess up layout a little bit because of the window, like I said. Technically the stud would be centered on this line instead of being on the edge. For a shed it's okay. If you want to add something above and below the window, you could double it up and put one above and below. But for a shed, we typically don't do that. But yeah, you would just continue lay out the same for the rest of it. I think I had showed this in a different spot in the video, but to make a mark, you can just use your speed square and just mark both of them. That way you only have to mark one plate, put the next one right beside it. Then you mark both plates all in one that way. The other question I may get is why just use a single top plate? Why not double? Typically in house construction and stuff, you do double. But for this, for a shed, I think single is plenty strong enough because my trusses are gonna sit right directly on top of the studs. So it's gonna be weight bearing all the way down. So I don't see the need for a double plate. But if you wanna do a double plate, then you just have to figure that into your overall wall height. So guys, if you aren't already, be sure to subscribe to my channel for future videos. And also go check me out on Instagram, at SmartEasyDIY. I'm usually pretty active on there. You can follow me to see what I'm up to on the daily basis. What I just did there with the window is I wanted from the bottom, I wanted it 48 to the bottom of the window. So I measured up 48, made a mark, which is four feet. Then I wanted two foot in between there. So I went six foot and then went on the other side of that. So the our actual opening here should be 24 by 24. That's usually the rough opening for a 24 inch window because they make the window 23 and a half by 23 and a half. But you'll have to check specifically what you need in your situation. 
important thing to think about when you're framing your walls, if you are going to want to heat this and insulate it for some reason, like you want to live in it, then you probably will want to go with a thicker wall, like a 2x6 wall instead of a 2x4 wall. And in the grand scheme of things, it won't add very much money to your whole project. So that is definitely something to think about because you'll get a lot more R value with having a 2x6 wall than having a 2x4 wall. So something to think about as you're framing. Okay, so this is how the front wall came out. I ended up doing a five and a half foot wide opening because I'm going to do two double doors and I made it six and a half foot tall. I figured that should be good for, I'm a six foot guy, so I can walk in there just fine. Ended up coming up with four and a half inches of spare, so I put three two by fours in there on edge. That way I made up a solid header just in case I need a solid one. So it turned out nice. So I just laid it out the same way as I did the window. I figured out where center mark was and laid it out accordingly. Okay, so now that the walls are all set, usually what I do is brace it one way or the other. On the left side of the wall there, you can see I ran two braces, but it's just for extra. I just had an extra one, so I put it on there. But usually you can just run it in one direction or the other. Just make sure everything is straight and square and level, and then we're ready to set up for trusses. So as I'm getting ready to set trusses here, I put this block in here, and I just let it stick up about three feet up there so it'll catch the top of the truss. That way it'll keep it from flipping over. I just simply use a scrap 2 by and screw it together on edge there since it's nice and strong that way. Just run it down. This is just a 2 by 4 8 and then it'll yeah stick up about 3 feet there and it'll catch the peak of the truss. All right, I hope you enjoyed my little time lapse I did of setting the trusses. It was a little bit hard to do with one person. It'd be a lot easier if you had another person, but I was able to do it. It's nice and calm too. I wouldn't attempt this if this was windy, but you can see these are actually quite stable. You can't wiggle them a whole lot, but for now, I'm gonna brace them better before I start sheeting. But I just wanted to show you what I did for opposite tension. I put two screws on this side, and then on this side over here, opposite side, I put two screws on this, so it kind of gives them opposite tension, so it kind of holds them straight. And then what I did here is I just lined them up with the stud, and then I knew it was right on layout. You can notice this brace I put up. I ended up straightening this wall here. I knew that my walls were pretty straight because the lumber I picked out for the top plate was pretty nice and straight. But what I wanted to tell you, if you saw me, I was making marks on the trusses to make sure that they were all the same. Overhang, you can see right there on the end, I put a mark. I did that on all of them. So it was seven inches. And then I straightened the wall so that way they're nice and straight down through there, as you can see. No matter what you do, you're gonna get a little variation. So as long as your wall is straight and everything, you can see I got just a little variation there. It just has to do with sometimes with the thickness and the width of your lumber, even if you use the same jig. And so what I do is make one end perfect like that. And then this one, I just snap a chalk line on top for the measurement that I want, and then just recut the tails so they're nice and straight. So to secure the trusses for tonight, till I can get sheeting on them, what I did is right in line with my brace on the end down there, the end truss, I put some spacers here on top. I just spaced them two feet, and then brought them right over here to the end, and it's exactly 16 foot across there. So tomorrow I'm gonna do my sheeting. So it's always good to save your scrap blocks until you're all done, because you never know what you're gonna need to finish. Because what I wanted to do here is show you, for example, on the overhangs, what I did to get a nice flat spot for my board is I just went up tight against there with the 2x4 and made it flush out even with the rafter tail there. And that's what's going to be for my soffit. So you saw the time lapse of how I was doing these soffit blocks here. And this works really good. I have a one foot square. If you don't have something like that, you can just use a regular one. Works really good to put one nail in and then use your square, make sure it's nice and square and then finish nailing it. And then to finish the end out, you don't have to put a block on the inside, but it makes it nice you have something to nail against. Then I just hold a little block here and I would recommend white wood instead of fur larch for this because it's not nearly as splitty, it's soft. But just cutting this little block here, you can just hold it and then trace it from the backside and get a perfect angle there. Also in this build, guys, any tools that I'm using or anything that I think might be helpful to you, I'll include a link in the video description below the video that you can check it out there. It's a new day, fresh start. 
so far I have about a day and a half into this build. I'm not figuring any time for the base prep. I just did that a little bit in the evening, so I have a day and a half so far. So now I'm ready to start sheeting the roof with plywood. I'm using 5 8 inch plywood. Half inch just didn't seem like heavy duty enough, and I personally don't like OSB. I don't like the smell of it and all that. I think it works fine if you use the thicker screws when you're screwing your steel into, but I like the strength of plywood. And I did want to mention that really quick. For the 11 sheets that I needed, I needed one sheet for my plywood patches for my trusses, then I needed 10 sheets approximately for this roof here. Lowe's actually has a lot better plywood than Home Depot in my area. And the sheets at Lowe's were $20 for the plywood and $14 for the OSB. So it was about six bucks a sheet. So really it's about $60 difference in the roof material, whether you go OSB or plywood. So that's your call, what you want to do. I thought in this grand scheme of things for the overall build, since I don't like the smell of OSB, that for $60, it was worth it to me to get plywood. Also, the sheeting comes out a little bit strange on this since it's 16 feet, which would come out good for two sheets, but I need some overhangs as well, which are gonna be about eight inch overhangs, but I'm gonna figure a foot. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna let the plywood run long and cut it off. So I'm actually gonna put it in on the fourth truss, which would be six foot. I'm gonna leave two foot sticking out over and then cut a sheet in half and then do the same thing on the other end. So that's what I'm gonna do for one run. And then probably I'll split the difference, put a full sheet in the middle on the top run and finish it off with two partial sheets. But when you're doing the overhangs, this is just a thought that I had, but one thing you can do is watch out for damaged sheets and use the bad ends for cutting off for the overhangs. Like here, this whole end of the plywood here is delaminated. It has some issues. So since I'm gonna be cutting a foot off, it's solid back here but I'm gonna use this out over, so this is a perfect end sheet. So just something to keep in mind when you're doing stuff like that. Also, another thing that's easier to do when you're up on the roof there, so you don't have to do some measuring, is you can measure on the ground. And I did two foot marks all the way down the edge, and I also did it in the middle and on that edge. You can do a square all the way across if you have a straight edge to make a line, if you want, to nail. But I can side it good enough for between those two feet that I can just nail it that way. So that's just another thing you can do. So I got this side of the roof all sheeted and I got the overhangs cut off so they look a lot better. Now I wanted to mention something really quick. It doesn't come out very good as far as waste with this dimension just because it takes over a half a sheet for width. It was 32 inches that top sheet was and then it also takes over a half a sheet for length. But I think I might piece it a little bit on the other side. I'll see what I come up with to save a sheet. But if not, it is what it is. I'll use the scraps for something, maybe building shelves in this shed in the future. So it won't go to waste. You can always use plywood scraps for something. The other thing I wanted to say is working on a hillside like this, it's not bad, but a little bit of a hillside. I really like this Werner ladder. It's an extendable ladder, so you can work off of either side and you can make it more level and stuff. I know Little Giant is another brand that's readily available. So they're a really handy ladder. You may want to check into that if you have a lot of hillside work to do, but... It's do it yourself on nights and weekends, so you just do what you got to do with what you got. You know, that's pretty much what DIY stuff is usually. Another thing I wanted to mention is very important to be safe. If you don't feel safe doing it the way that I did it, I experimented with different things. Putting the sheets up from the outside, bringing them up from the top down with the top layer. You just can experiment with whatever you got. And it is a lot easier with this size of a build to do it with two people. But I did it by myself just to show you that you can do it by yourself if you are careful and all that. But... Just don't do anything that you feel unsafe. All right, so I did want to mention when I did the other side of the roof here, when I sheeted it with plywood, I did end up using two strips that were 16 inches wide right there to make the 32, the remaining of it. I ended up having to do that and do a small piece over here to finish out the end. But by doing that, I was able to save a sheet of plywood. So that really helped out. All right, guys, I got my roof sheeting all on on both sides and trimmed off. I'm waiting on staples to put the vapor barrier on, but I wanted to talk to you about these nailers that I'm putting on the side here to nail the siding to. I figured out that just putting one run in the middle is enough for support for the siding I'm gonna use because I'm doing rough cut board and batten. So if you need more support, you could put two runs in there. And on the top here, I decided in my particular instance, I'm gonna keep it down six inches from the soffit there because the soffit's an inch thick, so that's gonna drop it down an inch. And then 
I can nail my boards, but then I'm going to put some trim horizontal under there and then butt my battens into it. So I want to be able to have something to fasten my battens into as well. So that's why I dropped it six inches to the bottom. So that's what I did there. Then I just split the difference for the middle run. So now that I did that, I'm using up all the pieces of wood that are too crooked to use for anything else. This is a really good chance to get rid of them since you're doing a lot of short blocks. So there's always crooked pieces to use up. So now next I have to do this end over here and I have to do the back and also the front here. Blocking put down that side as well. Now I gotta do it on the end over here. I just gotta take my brace off here. I left it on till now for doing the truss there, the truss support. Everything's braced good with the sheeting on. So my son left me a present here, some rubber bands off the coils of nails. He's like, Daddy, I put some rubber bands on there for you. So now that I come here to take the block off, I find his present. So I'm all done framing back here. This framing here is a little higher than the sides, but I just wanted to split the difference up there in the middle. And then also I framed around this window here. So I have plenty of something to nail to for putting my trim in when I do the trim. That's why I added some all the way around. And then actually up there in the end truss, I decided that I need to add a two by four below the other two by fours in the truss. And I could have built this into the end truss. So that's something to think about when you're building trusses that you could put that in if you want to then, but it does add more weight to set the truss. So I chose to do it later. This is an inside view of adding that and I ended up actually putting another plywood patch in there just to support the middle because I had plenty of scrap plywood pieces. So I did that and it's pretty easy to do. You just cut the same angle as you did for the peak, an 812, and then you just hold it up against what I did anyway. Then I scrubbed the line on the inside and cut it off. Then I added it and I nailed through the plywood patch again with the same two inch nails up there as well and then down there. So that just gives you something to nail to once you put your overhang on, then you can still nail your siding to something. All right, now it's time to put synthetic underlayment on the roof. I chose to do synthetic roof underlayment instead of just felt paper, star, tar paper. You can put that stuff on too if you want. But this stuff here I really like. I got this at Lowe's. You can get it at Lowe's or Home Depot. It's Owen Corning's brand and it's a 10 square roll, so it does a lot of it. It'll be plenty. It'll actually be more than what you need. Now, if you just need a partial roll of stuff like this, you could check Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace and see if there's partial rolls just to save some money. But if not, this was like 90 bucks a roll or 80 bucks a roll. Most places, if you get some other brands, if you get the heavy duty stuff, they want like 120 to 150 bucks a roll. So I had showed a time lapse of the one side. I'm just here putting this synthetic underlayment on here. I was able to use this ladder here. You can kind of see I got it opened up and stood up here. And then I can just kind of lean against it and reach up there to get the last row done. So that worked out pretty good. Okay, so I'm standing on the peak of the roof and I got it all dried in over there. I just ended up cutting a sheet in half and putting it over the peak. I wanted to mention something really quick. If you are gonna vent your ridge, you'd wanna cut this out later when you do that and you wanna use stuff in your ridge to vent it properly. I'm not gonna do that, just, I'm just gonna use it for a shed. But for a tiny house, you may wanna do that. So I've been putting some house wrap on here. What I decided to do is use my decking here since it's nice and flat. And because it's kind of an odd size, I didn't wanna cut the whole roll since I'm doing the sides first. So it worked out pretty good to do it in here. I just had to cut a section and pull it up over that wall a little bit, make sure it's long enough. It'd be 16 feet and then cut it the whole way. Also, the reason I use house wrap in this demonstration is just to show you that you can use it. Like if you are going to want to insulate and heat your building, then you'll probably want to do house wrap just like you would on a normal house. So that's why I put Tyvek on here, just in the demonstration. I ended up getting Tyvek on this whole thing. On the front here, I had to piece it to have enough. I used a roll that I salvaged from a different project that had a little bit on it, but I was able to just to get enough. I didn't quite get it full width in the corners there, but it'll be covered by overhang. So I'm not really worried about it, but I did want to show you there that I did piece it. I did find this Tyvek tape here that works really good. So I did all the joints with that just to make it seal off better. That wrinkle there looks kind of bad, but I did what I could to get it out. Also guys, just a couple of thoughts I had. It kind of depends on what you want to do with your building. You could use this for a cabin or a tiny house, whatever you want to do. If you were to use it for a cabin, 
I had this thought where you could easily have loft in half of it. Like you could do the normal trusses, like say eight feet or so, like halfway in this example. And you could easily put like a little bed up in there and stuff, there's quite a bit of room. And then you could build cathedral trusses on this side and you could just leave this open for the most part, and it would feel a lot more open in here. Because with just doing a seven foot ceiling, it doesn't really feel that nice and open for like a cabin feel. This works perfect for a shed because I want to store stuff up in the ceiling here. That's why I did it this way. But just ideas, you could build a cathedral truss, which you would run this bottom cord up closer to the top cord, and you would just design your truss that way. You can Google search cathedral trusses if you're want to see more what that's about. But if you want to have this completely open all the way, you could also use like two by six rafters and just clear span it all the way up. You'd have to do a ridge beam probably and do the rafters and you wouldn't even need to build a truss design like this. Then it would be open all the way. It would be so much roomier in here. This would be really nice for a cabin to have this nice and open. So that's just some thoughts that I've been thinking about to share with you guys. Kind of depends on all on what your needs are, what you're looking for. Because with this video, you could do a shed, a tiny house, a cabin, whatever you want to do really. Also, I'm trying to get my overhangs done here, and I wanted to show you something. When I do the overhangs here, the rake, whatever you want to call it, the 2x4 that goes out there, what I did to get it very accurate is I put it up against the building, against the one that's there already, put a screw in it, and then scribed it right on the bottom the same length, and then that way I know it's exactly the same. I should have probably made a pattern when I did my trusses, but things can change a little, so it's good to do it this way, I think. So then you saw that I have a clamp here. That thing is really awesome for being a helping hand because I wanted to make sure that I get this lined up perfectly right on the edge there. And I wanted to make sure that my spacing was exactly eight inches. So to be correct. So that works really good to hold it until you get up to the top to put that in place and screw it. So uh, something simple like a clamp can be a really big help when you're doing it by yourself. So while you're doing the overhang there like that, when you're cutting the outside one, I cut one an inside one as well. I picked out a nice straight 2 by for the outside one. The inside doesn't matter so much because you're screwing it right against the building. So I cut two at the same time so I know they're exactly the same length. I do apologize it's a little dark here. I'm working on this in the evening but I'm trying to get the drip edge put on. I don't quite have my siding or my fascia yet. So what I did here on the end is I let it stick out about a 7 8 of an inch because the board's about a 1 inch thick. I want to keep it back just a little so I don't need to trim it. So you can see what I did there. And under in here, I did it about an inch out as well to compensate for my fascia board. So it'd be a lot easier to do this after the fascia is on, but since I don't have it, I'm just gonna show you what I did. So I had this little scrap of wood here that is a one inch thick. And so I used that to put the drip edge on with. So you can see it's gonna fit nice and tight once that drip edge is on there. So this way I can go ahead and put my steel on while I'm waiting for my siding. So I just wanna show you what I did there. And so what I did here is I did a full piece first and then from the front of the building typically if you're looking from the front you want to lap underneath so you don't see the lap from the front of the building. So that's what I did. So from the back side you'll see it a little bit but from the front you won't that way. So one thing also that's good to do when you're laying out your steel is to measure all the way one end to the other and see what your length is and then if you have the standard rib steel it's nine inches in between the center of the rib to the center of the rib on the steel itself. So you can divide it and figure out if that's gonna work. Like for me, the reason I say this is I'm gonna have some gable trim and it is three inches wide on the top part that has to go up over a rib and then it lands in the flat part where the gable trim is gonna be fastened. I'll show that later. But because of that, you need to do your math and figure out where you want your rib to be so your trim will clear it on either side. So you have some leeway because if you have to you could like cut this rib off when you start the steel right here if it helps you to get it right on that end but in this case it's going to be perfect if i just leave my steel right here my fascia board is going to go out here even with this but i'm just going to keep right even with the building and then my ribs going to come out good on the other end so i want to show you that and then because of that i use this inner closure here to seal off the bottom so insects don't get up in there so I think that's a good idea. They're really pretty inexpensive. You can get them with your steel. And then I measured and put this on according to layout where my rib's gonna be. And I'm just running it right close to the bottom so it'll seal off right at the bottom. And then you kinda wanna do that as you put your steel on. So I'm pretty sure two inches is what I want for my overhang, what I want it to stick down over. So I measured up at the bottom, made a mark two inches on the outside edge. And I did the same over on this edge over here on the leading edge when I do that. And this is the edge you want to start with because it laps over top of that sheet next. 
like this wide one goes underneath and then this one here goes on top. So you'll see as we go along. Then I just kind of measured and split the difference for the middle and then I'm not even going to worry about spacing it evenly under the ridge cap because it'll all get covered under there. So now that I brought most of the sheets over, all the full sheets that I could, now I need to cut the remainder piece here and I just measure back. Usually you measure back to the center of the rib. That way you always reference off of the center of each rib. So, but not to confuse you, you can just measure back and just uh, cut it even here or however you want to do it. You'll have room basically once this fascia gets on here, that's all going to get covered with that gable trim. So yeah, in this short of a span, just screwing it on the bottom and one in the middle and on top is just fine. The ridge cap will even screw through everything since it's long screws. But if you have extra screws, you can put some in the, under the top there because it'll get covered by the ridge cap too. So what I did since I'm overhanging two inches is I stayed four inches up with my screw. So my screw ends up being about two inches up kind of in the middle of this drip edge here. So yeah, and I just screw about a half inch beside the rib like that. Put it in, just snug it up so the washers don't leak. So the one thing I wanted to show you, if you just need to cut along a straight line like that, along a rib, you can use the utility knife of any kind. That's just one I had. And you can just score right along there. That's what I did. It came out so it came out just beside the rib like this. So if you score it like at least three times or so, so it's really good and scored in the same exact spot, then you can just bend it down back and forth a little, and it'll just snap right apart like that in a clean break. If you don't have a utility knife, what you can do is flip it upside down and cut it with the snips that way. It works best if you flip it upside down because then you have room to get under there with the snips. So that's just kind of a thought there too. So on my last one, you remember how I had run this a little long here because my fascia still has to go on here, my one inch fascia. And then this is back pretty much even right with the edge of the building. You can see there where I cut it. it came out really good just on the other side of that rib. But what I was going to say here is I leave these screws off along the edge here until the gable trim is on because you screw down through that. So you really don't need screws there. If you put them in there, they may be right in the way for when you do your gable trim. So it's best just to leave them off for now. So I'm up here looking at my roof now that I got it on and I had showed you I screwed a run in the bottom, one in the middle approximately. And it's up to you, you can put a run up top before you put the ridge cap on if you have lots of screws. And I wanted to talk to you about these screws. They are a 5 16th head on here and they're a 14 diameter is what the guy told me at the steel place. They're only one inch long. That way they won't stick very far through your plywood or OSB, whatever you use for roof sheeting. And this is extra aggressive thread compared to the normal quarter inch one. So they will hold a lot better in the plywood. Now here's a skinnier diameter, the typical size screw to show you, just to show you diameter. The reason I wanted to talk to you about these is I'm gonna use these for ridge cap. And you typically want these for ridge cap because you screw the ridge cap on the rib like this and you want plenty to go through the rib and down into the plywood as well. So that's why they're extra long. These are two inch, the others are one inch. All right, now a couple things I wanted to talk to you about when you're doing ridge cap. The way I do it, I set my piece up here first and you can see I kind of lined it right up with the center there. And then I sight right down to the other end down there and sight it to the middle. And then probably what I'll do is go along and make a pencil mark all the way along the bottom edge there and mark it all the way. You might wonder why this looks so funny. It has a plastic film on it yet that I didn't peel off. I don't want to scratch it while I'm up here experimenting. Then what I do is I got this outer closure I had showed you before. You know how we did the inner closure down there at the bottom to go underneath. Now this one goes on top of the ribs because it's going to go up under the ridge cap there. Pretty much want it in this flat part so it seals it off good but i would say about a quarter inch up or so because it'll squish a little bit when you put the screw in so if you make your pencil mark first so you know exactly where center is not only will that give you a place where to line up your ridge cap then when you're screwing it down but you also will want to keep your closure strips up a little bit from there since i'm still going to have a one inch board on there I'm gonna let this hang over about an inch and a half because that way it'll stick over a little bit over my finished gable trim on this edge here. If it's too much, you can always trim it back later if you don't like it sticking out over a tiny bit, but I like it sticking out over a little bit. So excuse all my dirty footprints on the roof, but this is with all the closure strips in place. Got this all marked out, did my pencil lines, and I got them relatively straight across there. So it's a little dark, so I didn't do a time lapse of me doing the ridge cap, but I wanted to show it to you. Turned out nice and straight. Got it all screwed off and ready to go. So guys, you can use whatever siding you want on your shed, 
but I wanted to show you what I did. I chose to go with a number three rough cut board and batten. I love the looks of it. This is Douglas fir, it's called. It is kind of a reddish wood, a little bit like larch is. But I wanted to show you this wood treatment that I'm using, what I did to darken it to make it look more rustic, which I love the look of rustic as well. And as I'm applying it here, I'll talk to you a little bit more about it. This product is called Rugged Wood Treatment, especially formulated to preserve and protect exterior wood like this. It's a perfect aged look for barns and outbuildings, for wood siding, logs, all that kind of stuff. It's a powder that you mix with water, and I'll show you a little bit here as I go along. It has enough mix in the bag for five gallon mix, and you can do a quarter cup per gallon, so you can mix it as little as you want, as much as you want, as long as you follow the correct ratio. And that will be on the back of the bag if you do purchase this product. So what you do is you apply it and when you first put it on, it doesn't look like it's really doing a whole lot. But after a bit, it'll start darkening and darkening. And after a whole day, it'll be really dark. So depending on what type of wood that you use, it can change a little bit how much it varies. Like sometimes it'll turn to like a grayish, a little more of a dark brown patina. The cool thing with this is you only ever have to do one treatment. It soaks into the wood. And the more that it's exposed to the sun and the wind and the elements and stuff like that, it'll just make it go deeper, penetrate deeper. So when you're applying this, you can use an airless sprayer, a pump sprayer or a brush or roller, or you can dip the wood in solution for several minutes. But if you use like a sprayer, then I would recommend that you would mix it and let it sit for about five minutes, stir it really good, and then strain it before putting it into the sprayer just to make sure it doesn't plug it up. The best thing that I found like when you're doing it on rough cut like this is to brush it on. Like you could stain it after it's up, but I chose to do it first because that way it can soak in really well. And that worked really well for me. So whatever you want to do with that. And if you do end up purchasing it, it will help to go support my channel so I can do more video projects like this. And I would really appreciate that. If you do end up wanting to purchase it to stain your shed, I'll include a link down in the video description below the video and you can purchase it there. Be sure to leave me a review and let me know how you like it how your project turned out. Also, you can tag me on Instagram at Rugged Wood Treatment, and you can also tag at Smart Easy DIY, but that way I'll know what your project turned out at because I'd love to see what your projects turn out like when you do this. So the one thing I wanted to say too about the Rugged Wood Treatment is that it is environmentally friendly. It's non-toxic, it's maintenance free, it's easy to apply. That's why it's awesome that it's non-toxic. There's no smells at all, no harmful smells. It's safe to use around your kids and your pets. The only warning that I would give with it is that it does stain concrete. So do not apply it close to concrete because it'll permanently stain concrete. And also make sure to wear gloves when you're handling it because it will stain your hands. It'll eventually come out, but it will stain your hands. Kind of a rusty color. But that was kind of the main thing I wanted to say about that. It's getting a little dark here, but I decided to put my soffit up underneath here. I did it all in one piece, 16 feet exactly. And this is a six inch one. You can see here there's a little bit of a gap, but the siding is gonna go on here. And then the trim board is going to go under there too. So that's plenty. So I want to show a really quick trick here. If you're doing a long piece like this and you need to know where to stop it so you know where to nail it when you're in the middle, because you have to pretty much go in the middle. I just screw a block on the outside like that. And then as soon as you butt against that block, you know you're right in place. Then you just start in the middle and line it up and nail it and then work your way to each edge. Now, when you're doing your soffit, you may want to think about venting your soffit. If you're going to be heating this building, like for a tiny house or something, you may want to vent it just like you would a house. So you may want to consider putting some venting strips in between your boards, ripping your boards narrower, putting this venting strip in between. Here's a picture of an example of what I'm talking about. So that's just something to think about when you're doing your soffit. Then I did the fascia on the front there. That's a one by six as well. Since the bottom one under there was exactly 16, this one with the overhangs, I had to use two tens and cut them in the middle there. So what I did is I made it even on this one right here. And then the outside one's gonna run down past even with that. And then but first I'm gonna put the soffit under there too. Got a little different story today on the weather. It's been snowing this afternoon, but I'm back to doing some more fascia here. Like I said, I used a 10 footer on this end and a 10 footer on the other. So what I did is I just measure and then splice it halfway on that joist. And then what I've been doing is just two nails because there's only about five inches showing. So I do a nail in there and I stayed back a little from the end on the bottom so it doesn't split. But I've been nailing into the soffit board and into the rafter tail. So there's two nails in each one and I'm using like an eight penny, two and a half inch ring shank galvanized nail. So you want to make sure to use galvanized for nailing exterior like this, but also the two and a half inch ring shank really hold. So then what I do is I just measure all the way out to the end and measure back and then cut that piece, put it up. 
also the way this has been coming out, see how it can just shove up in there behind my drip edge that I put up? And then I've been letting it hang down about a half an inch. I just think it looks really good to have about a half inch reveal under there. I've just been working in the evenings here, so it's been a while since I've been able to get good clear footage because it's been snowy or dark. But I wanted to show you here what I did. So you saw where I did the soffit down the sides there and the fascia. And then what I did is I put soffit under here. I ended up ripping it back a little bit just to save on boards because the siding is going to go up there and cover that. And there'll also be a trim batten. But what I did is I just cut that at an 812 on the bottom, since that's what the pitch of my roof is. And I cut it at an 812 up there at the peak. So then I just made it flush with the outside. And then I'm gonna cut the ones for the outside here. They're gonna be 812 top and bottom as well. I ended up having to get a different board because the ones I had stained weren't the straightest. So I got this one. I'm gonna have to stain it later because I don't have time tonight. But I wanted to explain why it's a different color. But anyway, what I want to show you is how you get this first one in place by yourself. See, I wanted it lined up right here, and then I'm gonna cut this tip off right here, so that way it's flat underneath there. So it's not focusing, but you can kind of see I marked it under there, and then I'm just gonna cut it square. I'll show you after it's installed. But the thing I wanted to show you is for the first piece, you don't have anything to butt against up there, so you can measure it and get it really close based on what the rafter itself measures, because it's the same measurement, pretty much, give or take. So then what I do is I line it up on the bottom here where I know it's gonna be exactly flush with this other one, and then I put a screw in there about two feet up just to hold it for now. It's gonna get covered by the metal gable trim there. So that's why I put it up there because it's gonna be hidden later. So then you can climb up here to the peak and make sure that you're lined right up with your plywood there. And you can see it's lined right up with the joint all the way. So you know you're right in the right spot. It seem like a lot of work to do it that way and you can do it by yourself that way. But if you do have another person helping you, it would be so much faster. But just wanted to show you how you can do it yourself if you have to. So never mind my mess. I'm right here in the middle of cutting this. So this is the edge trim that I was talking about. And what I do is I just measure the length and then make a square mark all the way across. This still has the protective film on it as I'm doing it. And then the first one, I just cut it square up in the peak. And then the next one, I'll cut an 812 on it. I'll show you kind of as I'm doing it. So then this piece, you remember how I actually marked it square there? I found out that it hits on the ridge cap up there so what I did is cut about an inch over. You can see my cut, I saved it so you can see. And then make sure that the outside is square. But as long as this is all hidden under the ridge cap, so I just came out to a point and then came down and came an inch back because it hits against the top of the ridge cap if you don't do that. So several things I wanna point out since I'm doing this in a different order than you might be doing it because I was waiting on my fascia. But I think this is easier to do once the fascia is on because you can put it up tight like that and nail it. So in this case, what I wanted to share with you is when I did the roof, I screwed the ridge cap all but the last one, but I found out it's easier if you take about three rows back, take three of those screws out. So you have just a little bit of room here to wiggle this. And then under in here, do you remember this closure strip that we did and we ran it all the way to there? So what I found out is wherever this comes up like this, you just have to cut that back, cut it a little bit long and then that way it'll squish against it. So this shows better what I mean. See how I cut that back? I even cut it a little short probably, but and then you want to cut it back and then lift it up a little bit so your thing can slide underneath it, your corner trim. Well then here's where I was saying that this one here I just cut square, and then the next one I'll cut an 812 so that way it comes down like this on the peak. So I just slide that all the way up in the peak there, and then once this is all in place, I'll come back up and screw the top, but I'm going to go down next and do the bottom. So this is the bottom. And what I do is make it even on the bottom with the roof there. And then I found out if you have a clamp or something, that really helps to hold it for you. Just gives you an extra helping hand. And then what I do is I just side up like this and then try to make it nice and square with the, your fascia. So it's standing straight up and down. That's how you know how far in and out to push this. And then you can screw it right in line with your other screws. The other thing I wanted to tell you is it's worthwhile using an eighth inch drill bit and pre-drilling this because there's so many layers you're going through. For that right there, you're going through quite a few layers because your bit tends to wobble. And if you don't hold everything just right, if your screw gun slips off, it can make a mess. It's best to use a drill bit, pre-drill it, and then put your screw in that way. Then what I do on the side that I'm working on is I put the screws back in the ridge cap there, make sure everything's down nice and tight. And then this end one, I just put it kind of in the middle of this section and I pre-drill this one as well and then put that in. 
Oh, also while I'm doing it, I make sure that this is pushed in nice and flat and square against the fascia when I do that. Then next, I'll put one down in there, pre-drill that one and put one down there in that row of screws in the middle. So what I did on the first one is I just measured down off the bottom of the roof. That's what I'm doing there too. On the steel right there, just hooked onto the steel. Then I come up here and measure the peak. You can see I'm right at 85 inches. So if I do that and then make an 812 on the end of this, it should fit right in there nice and tight. So this is the next piece I'm cutting. That's the bottom down there. This is the top. So what I was showing you is I'm gonna cut an 812. So I went right to my measurement, 85 to the long point. Then I'm gonna cut an 812 angle on there. And then this part here, I'm gonna notch this out as well. Again, like I did on the other side where it goes up against the ridge cap. Okay, so I got the bottom done. I got this in, I got all the screws in, in my ridge cap. Got that cut done there. So then I wanted to show you these little green trim nails that I have. They're like an inch and a half long. And this is what I like to use for on the face there so it doesn't stick out. I put one about four inches down or so from the peak, just anywhere close to the peak. Put one in the middle and put one at the end. That way it just keeps it from moving and flopping around in the wind. A lot of people put screws in and you can put screws in the same that you use for the roof. They match as well so you don't have to get these. But I just think it looks a lot cleaner this way. So that's why I chose to do it. So I wanted to show you that option. So on the peak here, I kind of hate showing this because of how the tin snips marked that up a little, but that's actually about a 16th. Like you only notice it because it's on green. So you could touch it up if you're worried about it. But what I was going to say is these screws here, I discovered after the fact, if you remove them after you get this all done and then put them back in slightly at a downward angle, it kind of pulls this tight. So it's pretty much tight. You can see there, it looks like a big gap in the video, but it's only about an eighth of an inch. So it's not very much. If you are worried about it, you could potentially put a screw in on the top there, another screw, but I chose to just leave it since it's nice and clean. So that's what I ended up doing there. Now it's the next evening, still got snow on the ground here, had a freak snowstorm here in October, but I got this siding all leaned up here, I got it all cut ahead, so I'm ready to start it up. So usually what I do is I just make the first one even with the end there, get it nice and even on the bottom, and then some of the boards are kind of curved, they're not exactly straight, so I just try to split the difference. Like say if it's gap top and bottom, I try to make the gap kind of the same, and then I go a little ways and check it for level, and then when I get close to the end, I measure off the end just to make sure that it's good and that it'll come out pretty even. There's a lot of stuff in the way, but I wanted to show you. So now I open my window up. I've been keeping it closed just to keep the weather out till I'm ready for this. Then I measured exactly center in the building. I'm going to put the siding on first, then install the window and seal it, and then put the batten and trims around it. So I made a mark all the way up just to confirm that it's the center of the building, which it is. So I cut some flat on the bottom and 812 on the top, and then do the ones below the window since they're cut. And then I can just go ahead and keep going around the window and all the way to the end. So I'm building some door frames here for the double door. What I decided that I'm going to do is up here, I'm going to lap up over onto the top an inch and a half there on that two by. And then I'm going to lap all the way down to the bottom. So what I did here is I just built some door frames. I 45 some two by fours. I measured the overall opening and then I'm going to make everything a quarter inch gap so it has some room to swing. So say for example, this door opening is 60 inches wide. So half of that would be 30. So I made each door 29 and a half. That has a quarter inch on the edge here and between the doors. So you'll see what I mean when I get it all together. So what I did is I just laid it out here on the floor since it's a nice flat surface. And I put a two by in the middle and then I put some braces just so it doesn't sag over time. Once I had the middle in there, I just laid this board on top here and figured it out. It was a 29 degrees on mine. I'm just gonna hang one side at a time so that way I can get in and out easy enough. 
What I did since I wanted a quarter inch gap, I decided it's probably easiest to build this door in place. So I made a shim there, quarter inch block on the side and on the bottom in that corner. And then I did one up there as well. I didn't even do one up there. I just kind of checked it to make sure it was okay. And then I clamped it there with a clamp on the inside to kind of help me hold it. And then what I did here, I put a screw in. I didn't put it in all the way, but I made sure that it was even on the outside and I just put a screw in there just temporarily to hold it. And then I did the same up there just to temporarily hold it. Then on the inside, I'm trying to figure out a way to do it. What I did is I just made this block and I screwed this part in all the way. I made sure it was even for inside and out right there. And then I put this screw in, not all the way, but just to hold it. Then that way, this thing can't go anywhere. I can now take the clamp off. I just wanted to show you what the, on there. Then I did the same for the bottom. I screwed a block in this way and then just put a screw that way. My screws are three and a half inch, so if I drive them all the way through, then they would stick in the way to put the siding on, so I don't want to do that. But it's mainly just to hold it there so it can't go anywhere. So then what my plan is, is I want to put the siding on. On one side of the door, I want to put the hinges on and then back my screws out. Then I can open that door, mount my other one in there temporarily, tack it in with screws, and then just back them out when I side that one. So that's my plan, that way I can get in and out. So to show you what I did here for my first board is I wanted to make it all out of one board so it looks continuous. Of course, I didn't nail the top on the door side, just into the door itself. Nailed it everywhere I could in the door. And then I didn't nail the bottom as well, just into the door. And I made a center mark and stayed back just a little from the center mark. So I did that top and bottom. And then I nailed the rest of the board going on up. And I just kind of leveled it off of this board to make sure that it all lines up. So I wanted to show you I got this side all sided. Then my goal is to get the hinges on this door, that way I can move it. The one on the far left there is even with the gap on top, so it's an eighth inch taller than the rest, that way it has room to open. That's so I can mount my hinges. And then what I did is a one by four across the top, and then the two edges. And then I put one in the middle for the hinge. Then I ended up putting a 10 inch board at the bottom, just so that way my hinge reaches, because to take into account for the part that sticks down past the bottom there, so it goes all the way down. And I think it looks cool with that extra wide. So that's what I did there. So now I gotta put three hinges on here and I wanted to do heavy duty hinges. So I wanted to show you what I'm doing here. I thought black would look really good on here. These are natural hardware, extra heavy duty hinges. They're six inches and I'll include a link in the video description below the video where you can get these if you want. The best place that I could find them, no place locally carried them. I had to get them online. So I wanted to show you that. And then I'm gonna use quarter inch bolts that I painted the heads on with Rust-Oleum, which I'll show you. So for the bolts for the hinges, I just used this Rust-Oleum. It's a primer and paint together. And I used it and I put all these bolts into the box like this. Just stuck them into a piece of cardboard. It holds it up that way. I was able to get around all angles. And I painted the heads because it was a lot cheaper to buy regular bolts and just paint them myself than to buy black ones. Well, I got the rest of this sided all the way up through there. So I left just a little bit of a reveal probably about an eighth of an inch between the door there and then a good eighth on the top there between there. Did about a light eighth there on that edge of the door as well. So now I gotta trim it out with the battens like I did over there and then I'm ready to put the hinges on. So the window usually I like to set it in the opening and check it because it's usually a little undersized so you can kind of split the difference from side to side and then make sure that it's level and everything's gonna work. Now for setting the window, it's just a shed window, so it's not quite the same as for a normal place. Unless you're doing this for a tiny house, then you may want to do it differently if you're going to insulate it and heat it. I just use a window and door silicone. And then on the inside, on the top, I put a nice heavy bead along the top. And if it squishes out a little, it's okay because the trim is going to cover it. So I just put it on nice and thick on there. And then when I put it on there, it'll squish out. I'm going to use this outdoor rated screw to put the window in. It's a slim head. You can use this or use a nail, like a roofing nail, to set the window. Okay, a couple things about the window quick. If you're just doing this for a shed, this is a great window. This is like $45 at Lowe's for a two by two window. That's really hard to beat for that price. A lot of them are more like $70, $80 at other places like Home Depot. But this is a great option for a shed. Now, if you're gonna do a tiny house where you're gonna live in it and it's gonna be heated and all that, you may wanna look at a little nicer window, like a very well insulated window. 
Also, white was the only option. I kind of thought about doing like a clay colored to go with the shed, but I thought, you know, for the price difference, I'm gonna just do this one and I think it'll work great. So I wanted to show a couple trim details. Never mind my bright colored trim board up there. I stained it, it's gonna turn darker. I like this side better than the other side, so I flipped it over and stained it before I put it up. And then, so what I do is cut an 812 to go up on that end. And then I cut it right to the long point there. And then I trace the back side with a pencil, even with the other. And then I cut that and then nail that one up. And then on this side, going down the side here, I'm gonna put a one by four up there too for a batten. But on this side, I put it up on the here first on the outside and I make it even with that one right there. Then this one is gonna lap over. See here, this is just a little trim detail, but this is how it came out. So it's gonna be just over two inches. I'm gonna cut in square and then go up at an 812 the rest of it. I'll show it to you once I'm done. There's the cut detail I was talking about over on the other side with the 812 on part of it and then square on the rest. So on the board, that's how I draw it out. I do an 812 for a little ways and then I measure in on the flat part, which was two and a quarter in my case for the square part and then mark it out. So I cut this with a circular saw. You can try some different methods if you want, but I cut one way in then the other and then finish it out just with a knife or a jigsaw or whatever you have on hand. You can even use a handsaw if you need to. I wanted to mention as you're doing trim out here, if you have a little leftover of the rugged wood treatment, you can just keep it in a bucket out here. I have the brush there too in case you need to touch it up. But whenever you make a cut on the end of a trim board, you don't want to have to touch it up later. You can just dip it in this solution right here just for a couple seconds and then you can put it up and it's good to go. You can see here, like here's a cut end that I did. I did that and so that'll darken over time, but it's a lot darker than it was. So I did that with that. Any kind of cut ends like there. So anything like that where I do it, I dip them the bottoms and the tops in the solution. Then you don't have to brush it on later. Then of course, once you're done, you just dip this down in the solution for a little bit. And then once it's up for a little bit, it'll change color. So something I wanted to mention really quick about doing battens. I just look in sight for center of the gap, the crack in the board. I don't get it perfect, like I don't measure it out perfect, because I think that's part of what makes it look rugged and rustic is to just do it by eye. So I've done a lot of it, so I don't really even think about it, but I just nailed the top, sight it, and then I sight the bottom and nail it. And then as long as the battens aren't really crooked, which I can just kind of tell by eye, then I nail the middle. So. If you have a really crooked batten, you may want to do the measurement based on the gap there, but I would recommend just putting it on there by eye. You're doing siding up here on the gable ends. What I do is, say for example here, you can see my pencil mark a little bit. I measure from the center and measure like just under inch and a half because my boards are a little bit less than three inches. So to split the difference and then to measure up from the bottom and measure that long point. Then I cut an 812 pitch on the top of that one and just line it up with the bottom down there. So there's this national hardware latch that I really wanted to use on my shed because it's really rugged and heavy duty, has good reviews and all that. But this part right here isn't long enough. I could potentially cut this off and have a buddy of mine weld it. I don't have a welder, but I could have a buddy of mine weld it and extend this part. Since this goes through the door, if you paint it with Rust-Oleum, it would be fine, I think. But I decided that I'm not gonna do that. I just wanted to show you guys that for an option if you want it. I'll include this one in the video description as well, the link to it, if you are interested in checking it out. But basically, if you're looking for a black door latch for a shed, there's only two options really that come up. So the second option is this one right here. Okay, for installing this door handle, I want this door handle to be like this when it's closed, this to open. See how it works? It's kind of floppy right now just because I'm working on it. But so what I did here is I centered it in this one by four for up and down. I wanted it centered up and down in this way. 
and I drilled a 13 32nd drill bit hole through here. I didn't want it too sloppy. That's the size that'll work right there. So my initial thought was I was gonna put bolts in here too, so I didn't have to worry about somebody taking this off. But since this goes through here and gets bolted in here, I don't think there's much worry about taking it off. My concern with putting bolts through here, through the door, is that this handle will rub and won't be tight then. So then it won't latch tightly. So you pretty much have to use the screws. So these screws are square number one. So then I put this part on, that's a 764 Allen wrench right there. So when you turn the handle, it locks on the other door. Just like that, you wanna put it on nice and snug. So the one nice thing about this latch is that it is lockable. When the key locks it, you can't turn this at all. So it's very secure that way. Like I mentioned, it does have the square drive right there, but you can take those loose, but you still can't pull this out because the handle in there is locked in with that Allen wrench. And that thing actually does tighten down really good. So I think there should be no concern about security, somebody breaking in here. That's also why I did carriage bolts all the way through. If I just did lag, somebody could back out the lags, but this way they're gonna have a lot harder time. So for security, I recommend the carriage bolts. And me personally, I found it's a lot cheaper to just paint your own carriage bolts with Rust-Oleum instead of buying them black because if they're already painted they can be quite expensive so you have to weigh that out and decide what you want to do so on these doors on the shed the one that stays shut on the left i got these latches they're a rugged heavy duty latch and i'll include a link down in the video description where you can find those as well and they just screw on there and then they're spring loaded you can pull them up out of the way or down out of the way whether they're top and bottom and they work really well Okay, so here is the first look inside the shed now that it's all done and cleaned out. Open it up. So that's one door. Gonna undo the bolt here. Those things, they lift down and into place. Here's the upper one. I apologize for the lighting in here. It's getting a little dark. But wow, check out how much room is in there. So now you can see how bright and shiny the wood is without the rugged stain on it too. I think it looks really cool with the rugged stain on it. It makes it look rustic and aged, makes it look like it's been here for many years when in fact it's brand new. So total material cost for this shed, I have $2,300 in material. I will do an itemized breakdown for you down in the video description of what everything cost. But now if I looked at a comparable shed, say at Home Depot, and it was a lot cheaper quality build-wise than this is, it's the same size, but that shed was $5,723. So that's a lot of money when you're thinking about the price difference. Now, yes, I do have some time in building this, but I wanted to show you that you can do a lot better option yourself. And you know it's built correctly this way. The ones that I saw anywhere else, I was shocked at how poorly they were made. So all the cost of materials, I am not including the gravel, but I'm counting everything else. The gravel I had left over from a project, so I put that down and packed it down. So I'm not including that in the material cost. So a lot of this stuff I got at Lowe's. It was the best price for some of the different materials. One thing that helped out is I was able to find some coupons, and I'll pass those along to you guys. They're usually like a dollar or so, so very cheap to get. So any of the stuff that I used in this video, whether it's tools or parts, I'll include a link down in the video description as well so you can find the exact ones that I used if you're interested in that. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it was a long video, but I hope it was helpful to you. If it was, let me know in the comments down below the video that it was helpful. And if you did end up purchasing the rugged wood treatment, I wanted to say thank you again to you because that will go to help support my channel and help support projects like this in the future. And yeah, so be sure to hit me up on Instagram at SmartEasyDIY and also at Rugged Wood Treatment on Instagram and let me know, share your pictures with me, tag me in them so I can see what your project looked like. So, all right guys, I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.